Good morning to everyone. Welcome to Sunday Worship with Communion. I am Pastor Earl Roberts of the Marston's Mills Community Church, and we begin our service today with a scripture reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been risen from the dead. Amen. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer right now. Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice on Calvary, which bought our pardon. And we thank you, Lord, for the church that was born of this sacrifice. And we pray today, Lord, that as we gather around your body and, and as we gather around the body and the blood of Jesus, that indeed you will be with us as two or three are gathered in your name and that your very presence will continue to be with us. Bless your church, Lord, and make your church strong in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about, on the topic of to be and not to be. To be and not to be. And uh, remember that we are talking about the post-corona church. And uh, many of you have said to me, uh, Pastor Earl, uh, what is wrong with the church as it is now? Why are you keep? Why are you talking about the post-corona church? You, 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 are you implying that the church as it is now is defective somehow? And I want to tell you that that is not my premise at all. No, God is engaged, as I always say, in deliberate and purposeful activity. God is de engaged in deliberate, purposeful activity, and. Uh, the, 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 his purpose is to mature the church. His purpose is to bring the church to the next level of its maturity. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the church. Okay, in, 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 in the book of John, in the Gospel of John chapter 9, we read about uh, an incident that happened in Jerusalem. Jesus and his disciples were uh, passing through Jerusalem and... Uh, I, I pick it up from John chapter 9, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed through him. John chapter 9, verses 1, 2, and 3. And too often, we, like the disciples, we are looking for causation when what we should be doing is anticipating a glorious work of God. We're looking for to, to, to see who sinned, what was wrong with the church, why is this happening to the church, when in fact, our focus should be on 
the great work of God that he is doing through this coronavirus crisis. So, Pastor Earl, are you saying that the church is perfect? Well, we both know that that is not the case. Not by any means. But let me ask you a question. Let me tell you a little story. Uh, suppose you uh, brought your car to, the, 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 to your mechanic. And the mechanic checked the car out and he said, you know, there's nothing, nothing really wrong with your car. But if I, if I just tweak a few things here and there, you, you're going to be able to get much more performance out of it. And I, I believe that's what God is doing. It's not that there's something fundamentally broken about the church that needs to be repaired or needs to be fixed or need to be, uh, or we, we, we need something new to come in. It is that if God tweaks something here and there, that the performance of his chosen vessel, the church, will become so much better that we ourselves may not even recognize it. We ourselves will say, ah, oh, this is what we could have been. This is what we should have been. This is how God is going to move in the times to come. So are you saying that the church is perfect? Not by any means. The church, as we know, is not perfect. We will be perfected at the end of time in eternity that is when the church will be perfected. The church is, has flaws because we all have flaws. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But let me ask you a question. Are you sure that you are identifying the church? Will you be able to pick the church up out of a lineup if you had to? But do you know who knows the church? God, we ourselves, we, 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 are, we see people who claim to be church. We see folks who identify, self-identify as church. We see organizations that identify as church. But do you know that that final identification as church is not up to us? It is up to God. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19 tells us, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, having this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Do you believe that the solid foundation stands firm? The scripture tells us that. God ensures us. God assures us that his solid foundation stands firm. So, let me tell you that some people whom we identify as church are not his. And some people, some churches that identify as church are not his. You see, every, every, every church, every Christian who calls themselves church, who identifies as part of the ecclesia, as part of the called out assembled ones, must have the seal of God in order to be a part of that solid foundation. The Lord knows those who are his. We don't necessarily know those who are his, but the Lord knows. And Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So those, there are some people who confess the name of the Lord, but refuse to turn away from their wickedness. And there are some people who, in, in, at the end of time, at the judgment, God will say to them, you know what, I don't know you. I never knew you. Depart from me. So rest assured, uh, people, rest assured, church, that God knows those who are his. So we should not be concerned 
about whether or not the church is in error, whether or not the church has somehow left its moorings, some, uh, whether the church has lost its way. No, the solid foundation of God will always stand firm. No matter how it looks to us, how it appears to us, how it appears to the world, God always has a solid foundation. God has a plan through this coronavirus. And, and, and this coronavirus crisis is a part of God's plan to progress his church, to, uh, to, to, to promote his church, to get his church from one level to the next level. And germane to God's program of deliberate purposeful activity is that there is more. There is always more for the church. Look at uh, the next scripture I have. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. The first epistle of John chapter 3 and verse 2. And it begins like this. Dear friends, now we are children of God. It's a confirmation of our identity in Christ. Who are we? We are children of God. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. We are born again of imperishable seed through the living word of God. Who are we? Our sins are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Who are we? We are new creations in Christ Jesus. So we, that's who we are. Apostle John confirms who we are in Christ. The, we are children of God. But wait, there's more. There's more. The verse goes on to say, and what we will be has not yet been made known. So we are the children of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's who we are in Christ. And you can be confident and you can stand firm that you are his, you are his child, born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And there is more. What we will be has not yet been made known. So there's more for us to be, but it has not yet been made known. So I'm saying that we are, and at the same time, we are yet to be. So we are, and we are to become. And we hold these two positions in tension. And every child of God knows that who we are is not the final say, is not the final verdict. Who we are now is not the final picture because there is more to come. But it has not yet been made known what that more is. And so the verse goes on to try to narrow down to try to identify what this more is or what it would look like or when it will be. The verse goes on. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So there's a when, when Christ appears. And there's a what, we shall be like him. And there's a why, for we shall see him as he is. Now, this particular scripture is speaking obviously about the resurrection at the second coming of Christ. 
the final glory. But in between now, when we are children of God, and, and that, that, that glorious future that is promised, when he appears, that we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. In between the be who we are, and the what we shall be, what's in between there? What happens between the who we are and the who we shall be? What happens between the being born again and the seeing Christ as he is when he appears? This is what is happening that in between is what is happening through this coronavirus crisis. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the last verse, the verse 18, it says, I tell you a mystery. I'm sorry. There's a principle here, and we shouldn't miss it. The principle is that we become what we see. We are like Christ as much as we see Christ. So don't miss that principle. Even though it's talking about a when, a finite time, in sometime in the future, uh, it not even, it's not even proper to call it the future. It is when Christ appears at the end of time. Even though this particular verse, that particular verse is talking about that time, still it enunciates a principle. And the principle is that we become what we see. As a Christian, we mature only as much as our perception of Christ develops. Well, Pastor Earl, that sounds like a really good theory. But does the scripture back you up? Where do you find that principle in the scripture? 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. One of the things that Jesus did is in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, you know, some say you are Jeremiah, some say you are uh, Elijah, uh, some say you are one of the prophets. And then he said, who do, what about you? Who do you say that I am? What is your perception of who I am? And Peter said, and I believe he was speaking for all of them. Because by now and this, their perception of who stood before them had developed so that in their eyes, as they saw him, the revelation to them was that he was more than a rabbi. He was more than a healer. He was more than a prophet. Here, standing in their midst, was the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God, God in the flesh. And so Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so, they were able to attach their faith to the Christ whom they saw, whom they perceived, the Christ who was revealed to them. And we, likewise, must grow in our understanding, in our perception 
of who Christ is. There's a transformation that takes place as we grow from glory to glory, as we grow from revelation of Christ to revelation of Christ, as we, as we see Christ being revealed in more and more facets of his variegated nature, his, his unlimited facets, as we see more of him, we grow to what we see. We function in the Christ that we see. Our churches develop to the Christ that we see. And I believe that one of the reasons, in fact, I believe the main reason, God, I mean, God can do several things on several different levels for each and every one of us to, 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 to fit each and every one of our circumstances and where we find ourselves in Christ in our growth and development, both individually and corporately, God has the ability to do several things all at once. Praise his name. As a matter of fact, I was telling my wife the other day, I am writing, I'm making a list of all the things that he is doing for me personally in this crisis or through this crisis. And, and I believe it's an inexhaustible list. The main reason that there has been this punctuation, this full stop in our normal routines of church is that God has promoted, has jump-started for us a new and greater perception of Christ in order to accelerate our own transformation for his glory. And it's a good thing. It is what we've been praying for. It, it, it is what we've been hoping for. It is what uh, we've been serving God. And, 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 and I, I know on Cape Cod, for the last 15 years, we've been praying that the glory of God will be revealed. And God is saying, hey, that's exactly what I'm doing. What do we have to do? Well, we have to take the veil off of our face because it is with unveiled faces that we can contemplate the new aspects of the glory of God, of the glorious Christ, which God is introducing us to by force. You see, the, the children of Israel, whom Paul was talking about in this verse, he was referring particularly to when Moses is read in this verse. Their veil was their, their preconceived perception of who God is, who Christ is, and who Christ could not possibly be. So there was a veil on their face whenever even the scripture is read, was read, whenever Moses was read, Moses, that, that great humble servant of God, whenever he was read, there was a veil on their face and they could not see the glory of Christ. And church, I, I, I want to believe that we have unwittingly veiled our own faces, our own preconceived notions of who Christ is and how he should operate and his, what his ministry should be in our lives, in our churches, has, has dropped a kind of veil across our face. And God is saying to us today, that we have to remove that veil so that we can have a new perception 
of the glory of God. That's why we cannot go back to who we were before God removed us, God separated us from our routines. We can't go back to who we were because it is incumbent upon us to be a part of the answer to the prayer that we've been praying. Lord, we want to see your glory. And he's saying, yes, here it is. Unveil your face. And not only will you see the glory of Christ in you and, and innovative and tremendous, glorious ways, but you yourselves will grow to that image that you see. And every time we see a new aspect of his unlimited glory, we grow even more in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's what we've been praying for. Unveil our hearts, Lord. Unveil our minds. Unveil our heart, our eyes. Let us see him in his glory as he is. Let's see some new aspect of his glory. Let's see some new facet of who this beautiful, wonderful, unlimited, Savior of ours is. Dear Lord, work on our hearts. Do the work in our hearts by your Spirit, Lord. Shake us up. Remove that which we have placed there, the, the artificial barrier, the veil, which we have unwittingly, Lord, maybe because it's the safe thing to do maybe because it's the denominational thing to do maybe because it's what we knew what we learned and the way we learned Christ but Lord I pray that you revolutionize the way we see Christ remove the barrier, remove the limits that we have set on you and be to us the even more glorious one so that we can truly be whom you have called us to be in this time. In Jesus' name. Well, today is the first Sunday of the month. And here at Marston's Mills Community Church, on the first Sunday of every month, we celebrate and commemorate and remember in community the body and the blood of Jesus. You know, none of this would be possible if it were not for the sacrifice of God's chosen and anointed servant, his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent into the world to give himself as a ransom for us to be testified in due time. And, and indeed, Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, every time we do this, we show forth we celebrate, we excite the Lord's death until he comes. And so I want you to get your communion emblems together. Ours is right here. And so I will give you just a few minutes, a few seconds to get them together. And... Uh, I'm going to read a very familiar and very important portion of scripture about 
this sacrifice which we are celebrating today. For I received from the Lord, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. Lord, we thank you for this bread. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your broken body. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Lord, we thank you for the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And truly, you have seen your offspring, Lord. Truly, your death has been effective, has been efficacious, has been it has been a successful death because through that death you forgave the sins of many. Through the shedding of your blood sins were forgiven. Through the breaking of your body Lord and we today in communion in, communion, in community we celebrate that death until he comes in Jesus name.